This lesson will be about some of the most common mistakes in orchestration that I've often seen as a teacher. I thought it might be useful to discuss them here as a kind of checklist, rather like the one a professional has in their own mind while working on a score. An important aspect of real craftsmanship is knowing what kind of problems can occur. I'm taking for granted that the people watching this video already know the basics about instrumental ranges and what's unplayable for each instrument. A common problem for beginners is not knowing what's really idiomatic figuration for a given instrument. For example, take this little arpeggio figure for violin. On the violin this is not particularly difficult since it contains two open strings and the other two notes are in the same position. But if you give this to say a clarinet it's a different story. At the limit it is playable but not at all idiomatic. A clarinet doesn't have strings so the leaps feel a lot more like always having to jump around among different registers. Listen. Here is a more idiomatic equivalent for clarinet. This is not completely effortless, but it's much more idiomatic figuration. One encounters this problem especially when people transcribe music from piano to orchestra. Here's a typical piano arpeggio figure. Attempting to translate this literally for orchestra leads to a disaster. First of all, there are no orchestral instruments with a range this wide, except for the harp but the harp cannot play loud enough to really give the feeling of a fortissimo dynamic. Of course, a harp solo might have a passage like this, marked double forte, but in terms of the orchestra's dynamic range, the harp can't add much to a tutti in a loud dynamic. In fact, it would probably be inaudible. Second, the piano would normally play this with pedal, so the orchestration would have to include some kind of sustained background resonance, on top of which we would need to hear the figuration appropriately rethought in orchestral terms. As in any successful translation between languages, one has to translate the overall idea, not the individual notes. And that's a much more complicated task than just copying the piano notes into a few different instruments. It requires that we rethink the music in orchestral terms. We've already discussed this kind of transcription in lessons 15 and 16. See the links below. Note that a computer could play all these examples of figuration, violin, clarinet, piano, with no difficulty at all. In a mix, a sound engineer could even make the harp louder than the rest of the orchestra. But just because a computer can play something is not an indication of how real performers would sound. The best way to get to know what's idiomatic figuration for each instrument is to look at intermediate level etudes. Not the beginner level, but not the extreme virtuoso level either. Rather, look at something a normal professional could play without too much difficulty. This brings up another common problem, knowing the level of the ensemble you're writing for. There are things that the Berlin Philharmonic could play comfortably that would be ridiculous for a high school ensemble. So if you're asked to write something for a specific group, make sure you know what would be reasonable expectations for that group. The second most common problem I see in beginning orchestrators is way too much doubling. As I've already discussed doubling issues in lesson 12 of this series, I won't say more here than that often they just don't know what to do with all those players, so they add lots of doubling. This is not the right answer for the reasons outlined in that lesson. Another common problem has to do with the relationship between orchestration and form. Orchestration is an important dimension of musical form. Orchestral contrasts are among the most salient of all. This means that orchestration needs to be well coordinated with the form. If we have two contrasting phrases, they should normally be supported by contrasting orchestration. Sometimes beginners get this wrong. Either the change happens at the wrong time, or the degree of contrast is wrong. Consider this example. Here is our first orchestration. There are many problems here. All of them are ways in which the orchestration contradicts the form instead of supporting it. First, when the trumpet and trombone enter in the second bar in octaves, they are much too prominent just to underline two notes of the phrase. Then, the second phrase is in the heavy brass. This is too much contrast for the musical material here, and it even has the bass doubled in the tuba an octave lower. Also, why does the trumpet enter on the last note of the first phrase? Finally, when the third phrase comes back in the strings, the brass fall out in odd places. For example, the first trombone disappears after a passing note, 
and the second trombone continues bringing up the bottom line, whereas the main melodic line has no such reinforcement. To say the least, the priorities are wrong here. The overall result is that the orchestration distracts from music rather than enhancing it. Here is a much better version. Here the flute doubles the melody in octaves, giving it a brighter color from the second phrase onward. When the two horns come in, they reinforce the peak of the phrase, as does the doubling an octave lower in the second violin. So here the orchestration does the equivalent of what a good pianist would do. It enhances the phrasing and the musical character. Of course, this is not the only possible effective orchestration of this passage, but any successful version has to be in harmony with the music's character and phrase structure, as this one is. In our next lesson, we'll look at some other common problems in orchestration.